chapter 8, and as you're heading there, I'll remind you of another familiar passage. As Jesus was involved in his earthly ministry, taking occasion, Mark reminds us to teach and doing a lot of his teaching in parables. And the familiar parable that he gives us of speaking about the one that's planting seed. The sower went out to sow and planted seed, and as he cast that seed around. Some of it fell on hard and stony, rocky ground, the, the, the byway, the wayside, ground that had been, tridden, had been trodden hard and seed simply sits on the top. And he said that the birds would come and carry it away. And some of the seed would fall on the stony ground, rocky soil, where it did not have much depth of earth, and so immediately it would spring up because it had no depth of earth, but when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some of the seed fell on thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit, and other fell on good ground and yielded fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30 and 60 and some a hundred. And as he began to explain to his disciples the meaning, the intent of this parable, we know that he's talking about the seed is the word of God itself. And these different kinds of soils represent the different hearts of those that would hear and be exposed to the word. That hard and stony ground, the word just sits right on it and Satan immediately is there to just take it away. They're not paying any attention. They're not ready to hear. That fourth soil is, of course, the one we'd all like to believe that we are. That we'll receive that word and take it in and God will use that in our hearts and lives to bring forth fruit for His glory in varying extent. But it's those two in the middle that always bother me. That rocky soil, that shallow soil, and the thorny soil. Because what happens immediately is that the seed does go in. And it does begin to germinate, and it does begin to sprout, and it looks like something's growing. But in the case of that rocky, shallow soil, there's no root system. And it sprouts right up, but as soon as the sun comes out, that root gets scorched and withers and dies. And Jesus says in verse 16, These are like those sown on stony ground who... When they've heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves, and so they endure but for a time. And afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. They stumble. And then those that are sown among thorns, those that, are, that hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things, desires of other things entering in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And I say these are the two that bother me when I read this, this parable. Because the recurring thought in my mind from a post cross post-resurrection viewpoint as a believer in Jesus Christ is I want to know are these people really saved or not will I see these believers will I see these people in heaven or not so the point that Jesus seems to be making here is that the response to the word is not something you're going to see at the end of a church service during an invitation but it's something you're going to see borne out over time. And if a person begins great, but then stops following, what does that say about the condition of his or her heart? 
If a person begins great, but there's just so many other things in their life that they allow to take priority. How often do I hear, you know, I'd like to be at church more, but I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. Some things, our world is not going to make it easier for us to gather, okay? There was a reason, I think, that believers were gathering. We see them gathered together on, a Sunday, e- on Sunday evenings a lot in the New Testament. They didn't, get, they didn't have a weekend like we do. So, you know, you've got to find time when you can. There are legitimate things that may keep us from gathering from time to time. But Jesus is talking about those that when it comes to following Him, there are just other priorities that take precedence. And whatever fruit would be produced by the word, it just gets choked. There's just not room for God-produced fruit in my life because there's just so much other stuff in it. I thought we were in John chapter 8. We are. But what we see here is a pattern that John has already shown us and and should be a word of caution for every one of us that has opportunity to hear the word of Jesus Christ. During this Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews have celebrated and at the end of the feast, Jesus has cried out, if anyone's thirsty in John 7, let him come to me. If you'll believe me, then from your belly there's going to flow a fountain of living water. I'm the source of the water that you need. You're here observing this feast and observing this water ceremony, reminding you of God's provision of physical water for your crops. I want you to know I'm the source of living water. If you're thirsty, come to me. And they've celebrated the lighting of these great lamps in Jerusalem that illuminated the whole city. And Jesus has declared for us in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. And we saw last week that Jesus declares himself as light for the world. He is light for those who follow. He is life for those who believe. And we read in John chapter 8 and verse 30 that many, as Jesus is speaking, Many believed on him. What was Jesus saying? Jesus said in John chapter 8, beginning with verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you're bearing record of yourself. Your record is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know where I came from, I know where I'm going, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh, I judge no man, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that has sent me bears witness of me. John 19, or 8, 19. Then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you, ni- you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And these words Jesus spoke in the treasury, in the area near the treasury, in the temple grounds as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. They're already upset by what he has to say, but he's still in control. Verse 21, then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you can't come? And he said unto them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you will die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. They said unto him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Even the same that I said to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. 
And I speak to the world those things which I have heard from him. They understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. And Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am and he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. We mentioned last week that Jesus showed us and exposed to us the reality. He crossed the chasm that we cannot cross. I'm from above, you're from below. You're from this world, I'm not from this world. We can't get to where Jesus is, but he came to us. And we saw that he was able to bridge that chasm by his cross. You are going to lift up the Son of Man. And when you do, it will be obvious who I am and what I have come to do. But once again, it's all about centering in belief in Him and who He is and what He's come to do. And as He spoke these words, verse 30, many believed on Him. Now maybe as we hear that, our first response is to say, that's great, that's wonderful. But if we've been reading the Gospel of John already, we might hold just, just hesitate just a bit. Because remember Jack, back in John chapter 2, in verse 23, it said, When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Because he knew all, he knew all and needed not that any should testify about man, for he knew what was in man. Many were impressed by the signs and thought there's something amazing about this man, but Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. As we said, he, he didn't believe their belief. There was belief, but it wasn't the kind of belief he was after. Well, all the way through John chapter 6, as Jesus gave out the, distributed the, the bread and the fish to the multitude, and they saw what he did. And it was a miraculous occurrence. It was a miraculous occurrence from the hands of Jesus Christ himself. They were so impressed that they said, this is our guy. And they were ready to make him, take him by force and make him king. And Jesus' response was not, hey, great, look at this crowd I've got. Jesus' response was, nope, that's not what I'm about. He sent his disciples away. He dispersed the crowd. And when he does finally have opportunity to speak to them following this event in the synagogue there at Capernaum, his first response to them is to say, the only reason you're following me is because I gave you, because I gave you lunch. You saw the food. You saw the bread and fish. That's what you're here about. That's not what I'm here about. And when he took time to lay out directly who he is and what he's come to do, and that relationship with God is all about belief in Jesus Christ and following him his way, the response that John records for us at the end of chapter 6 is from that point, many of his disciples turned and walked away and didn't follow him anymore. So when we see a statement here in John 8 now that says, as he was speaking, many believed on him, my first response is to say, that's great. My second response is to say, well, hold on just a second. Let's keep reading. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then, you my, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We're Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to anybody. What are you talking about? How do you say you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, amen, amen. I say to you, whoever commits sin 
is the servant, the slave of sin. And the slave abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard from God. That's not what Abraham did. Now, now may I remind you. Jesus is speaking these words, according to verse 31, to the Jews who said they believed, the Jews who believed in him. This doesn't sound like a very believing bunch to me. That's not what Abraham did. You do the deeds of your father, verse 41. Then they said to him, We are not born of fornication. A couple ways to take that. I think there's maybe a little bit of a dig at Jesus here. We know who our father is. We've heard about you. But we're not illegitimate children. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Jesus answers his own question, even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. The lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not." Notice what he says there. It's not even though I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Because I tell you the truth, you believe not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. God. Again, he said to the Jews that believed him, you are not of God. Jesus is light for the world. And Jesus' light exposes our darkness. That's the problem that John mentioned back in John chapter 3. That's the issue. That light has come into the world. This is the condemnation. This is the finding. As we put humanity on trial, this is the finding. That that light has come into the world. But men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. See, See, light exposes Jesus is light for the world, light for those who follow, life for those who believe, but Jesus' light exposes our darkness. Jesus illuminates our true condition. Verses 33 to 36, we see our true condition illuminated here. We are slaves to sin. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. There's light and life for you. Jesus says that if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And the response of the Jews is, we're not slaves. What are you talking about? We are free. What, 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 what do you mean? You've never been in bondage. What are you talking about? And, and I, I love that. Well, we've never been in bondage. Uh, have you read your history, first of all? But as one writer said, Jesus clarifies the nature of their bondage. It is a bondage to sin, which only Jesus, as the eternal Son of God, is qualified to break. 
We are slaves to sin. The one that commits sin is slave to sin. Yes, you are the descendants of Abraham. Yes, you are the children of Israel. But you are in bondage because you're still committing sin. And the one that commits sin is slave to sin. There's something here that needs to be dealt with that goes far beyond a question of your birth, a question of your parentage, a question of your nationality, a question of your religious observance. There's something at the heart level that is off. There's something at the heart level that is wrong. There's something at the heart level that needs to change. I was reading a couple of fascinating articles this past week dealing with uh, both just some, some cultural, the cultural phenomena that we see going on around us as well as a challenge to consider again the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And if you think back to the time in which that was written, where Moses and those that had been brought out of Egypt were surrounded by hundreds of gods. And we think of that and look back and say, oh yeah, they're all just stupid idols. But understand, as you go back and read through Scripture, there is a supernatural world that we don't see with our eyes. We're told in the New Testament that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. There is a very real and present supernatural realm. And it is the reality that as we consider the gods of the Old Testament, this was not simply lifeless idols, but there was demonic activity in back of much of this belief. So the call to say, you shall have no other gods before me, hit pretty hard and pretty personal in that world. But we sit today, thousands of years from that command, in a society that has been shaped more than we possibly realize by the truths that we've seen laid out in Scripture. And so when we hear, thou shalt have no other gods, our thought today is, well, of course, because there aren't any others. But again, there is an evil adversary at work. He is not God's equal in any way, but he is an evil adversary. His minions are active in this world. There are other gods, so to speak, at work. In this day and age. But what's interesting in what I read this, this past week, what's, what's pointed out is that in that day, you could actually say, okay, these false gods are being worshipped. We're going to stop worshipping these gods. We're going to put away these idols, and we're going to serve the true and living God. Today, what shape does the worship of false gods take? It's not an idol set up on a shelf somewhere. What is the God of our age? I'm convinced the more we look around us, the God of our age, we could say it this way, is personal autonomy. I will do what I want. That is the deity to be worshipped today. As one writer said, we take as a given the individual's right not merely to obey or defy the moral law, but to choose which moral standards to adopt, which values to uphold, which fashion of piety to wear, and with what accessories. See, the issue today is that I myself will decide myself what is right and what is wrong. We've moved beyond deciding will I obey what God says or not. We've gotten to a place now where what is true and right and good is up to me. Personally. Individually. As another writer pointed out, you know, it's a lot easier to tell somebody, listen, you're possessed with demons. You need to be released from that than it is to tell somebody, 
The worst God that you're serving, the, the most dangerous God you can serve is sitting enthroned right now in your own heart. You are enslaved to your own desires, to your own will, to your own autonomy. That's We don't buy that. That just doesn't sound right. But Jesus says that the one that commits sin is still enslaved to sin. And if the truth, if you know, you're, you're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples, and you will know the truth. See, we'll know the truth as we continue in his word. And that truth will set you free. But Jesus illuminates our true condition. We, we are slaves to sin. We're still in darkness. We're slave to sin. And again, the response is what we would expect. No, we're not. No, we're not. Jesus illuminates our true condition. Jesus illuminates, we could go on quite a bit here, but I keep moving. Jesus illuminates our true nature. And this is it. it. <laughs> you know, we mentioned a few weeks ago that people today don't have a problem with the idea of Jesus. We, we like a loving Jesus, a kind Jesus, a, a you know, beneficent Jesus, a Jesus that is basically a better version of ourselves. We're, we're, we're fine with that. But when you actually start looking at what Jesus said, that's when people take issue. In John's day, in Jesus' day, as Jesus was active, he's doing these miracles and people think, this is great. They're hearing him speak and they're hearing him take on the powers that be. All this is great until they start realizing what he's saying about them. And then this is not so great. Jesus illuminates our true nature. We are slaves to sin. That's, that's our condition. That's where we are. We could spell that out more from Paul's epistles as well. Peter has a lot to say about that as well. But it goes deeper than what we do. Jesus illuminates our true nature. We are set against Christ. I know that you're Abraham's seed, verse 37, but you seek to kill me. Because my word has no place in you. Again, how often have we said, beware of those who will try to separate Jesus from the word of God. I want to believe in Jesus, I'm just not sure about the Bible. If you take away the Bible, how do you know anything about Jesus? And Jesus says, here's the problem that you have with me. You, you're, you're seeking to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you are doing what you've seen with your father. And they're still not picking up the point that he's making there yet but they will in a minute he'll get pretty specific he said abraham's our father no he's not if he was you'd do what abraham did but you don't so they're starting to see and jesus is starting to help them understand i'm not talking about physical parentage here i'm talking about connection that is based on who you are and what you do the concept of being a son of someone is the idea of being one who imitates and does and follows in the path of that one. You are not children of Abraham. If you were really Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham does. Think back in my mind to Genesis 22, where God came to Abraham after promising him, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, and I'm going to give you offspring that you can't even number. And Abraham now is he's hovering there around the century mark. He's got all of one kid. And God comes to him and, I say, and says to him, Abraham, I want you to take your son. I love the way it spells this out in Scripture. I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him to me in the place that I will show you. And what we hear in Scripture, the next response is, early the next morning, Abraham saddled the donkeys, they got up and they started heading out. 
We have the divine commentary from the writer to the Hebrews who tells us that as far as Abraham was concerned, God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. And he did in a figurative way, the writer to Hebrews said, because in Abraham's mind, the obedience was already carried out. There, there was no question. This God that I worship, Abraham says, is he gave me the son. If he wants the son back, that's his business. But this is the son of promise, I know. But if, if God made the promise, God's going to have to figure out how to keep it. I don't know. That's the faith of Abraham. What did God say? That's what I'm doing. Well, how's that going to work, Abraham? Well, I don't know. I guess he'll have to raise him from the dead. You ever seen anybody raised from the dead? No, but I just can't see how else this will work. Well, how else did it work? Well, God got him up there. And Abraham raised the knife to take the life of his son. And the angel of the Lord stopped him and said, Nope, I've got another plan. And he spared Isaac and he spared Abraham that event of taking the life of his own son. And we read in Romans that God, who did not spare his own son, but willingly gave him up for us, how much with him will he not also freely give us all things? That's what Abraham's faith looked like. Their response to Jesus, they want to kill him. Jesus said, that's not Abraham. You're not Abraham's kids. We are set against Christ. One writer said, with Christ came judgment into the world. A light of discrimination from which there is neither retreat nor sanctuary. And this means that as a quite concrete historical condition, the only choice that remains for the children of post-Christian culture today is not whom we serve, but whether to serve Him whom Christ has revealed, the true and living God, or to serve the nothing. There's no third way that lies open for us. Because as all of us know, whether we acknowledge it consciously or not, all things have been made subject to Him. All the thrones and dominions of the high places have been put beneath His feet until the very end of the world and simply said, there is no other God. Well, that's not what we want. As another put it, they desire Jesus' gift of life as an additional adornment to the moral and spiritual status that they presume to possess already by virtue of their Jewish inheritance. But Christ can never be had as an addition to our natural attainments, a part Savior who complements our personal achievements. He is the Savior only of the desperate who have nowhere else to turn and no other on which to call. That's why you've heard me say, what is it that I'm trusting for my salvation? I am, I've, I've thrown the full weight of my trust for my eternal soul on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. That's it. I have no plan B. If I'm to stand before him one day and have him say the blood of Christ is insufficient to cover your sin and make you mine, I do not have anything else. Do you understand that? That's it. That's what I'm trusting. Is that what you're trusting? See, these people believed Jesus until he started to tell them what real belief means. How to keep moving. We're set against Christ. We are ultimately sons of Satan. I get back to, you know, the, the old bracelets. What would Jesus do? Verse 40, now you seek to kill me. A man that has told you the truth which I have heard from God. This did not Abraham. That's not what Abraham did. You do the deeds of your father. They said, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, if God was your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth from and came from God. Neither came I from myself. But he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I'm telling you the truth, you don't 
believe. He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. As one writer summarized here, Jesus clarifies the nature of their bondage. It's a bondage to sin, verse 34, which only Jesus as the Son of God is qualified to break. And the inadequacy of their response is now clearly disclosed, verses 37 to 47 that we've read. Their true father is not God, but the devil. They have no, word, no room for Jesus' word. They're ready to kill Jesus. They do not love Jesus, although he has come from God. They are unable to hear what Jesus is saying to them, and they refuse to believe in Jesus, although they cannot prove him guilty of wrongdoing. In general, they show the twin characteristics of the devil. Lies in that they reject the truth of Jesus and murder in that they seek the death of Jesus. In all of this, they demonstrate they do not belong to God. And he continues, lest we think, yeah, boy, those people are awful. He continues, these verses represent a damning indictment of human nature. As Reinhold Niebuhr remarked a generation ago, no amount of contrary evidence, listen to this, no amount of contrary evidence seems to disturb humanity's good opinion of itself. Hey, think about that. Isn't that true? Well, people are basically good. Have you read a newspaper? No amount of contrary evidence seems to disturb humanity's good opinion of itself, but the evidence is there on every hand in our own period from the horrors of Auschwitz and a thousand other wartime hells through the killing fields of Cambodia and the wasted millions of Stalin's gulag besides the daily toll of gratuitous violence, rape, abuse, abortion, torture, and murder in every corner of the globe. Jesus' view of human nature in these verses has been and continues to be abundantly verified in experience. And even those of us who are able to say truthfully, I've never killed someone else, remember Jesus' own words, the same heart that results in murder is that heart that starts out with hatred against another person. James told us if we break the law in one point, we're guilty of the whole thing. We're lawbreakers in our humanity against God. And this is our condition. Jesus is the light of the world. His light exposes our darkness. Again, John 3. This is the finding. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because our deeds are evil. Turn that light off. We don't want to see who we really are because we want to keep doing what we're doing. Jesus illuminates our true condition. Jesus illuminates our true nature. This is not fun. This is not happy. I'm not feeling real good about this. I'm not either. But thankfully, Jesus also illuminates true belief. Moving back to the very statement that he made at the beginning of this passage for us. He said to those that believe, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. One writer comments, now Jesus lays down exactly what it is that separates spurious faith from true faith, fickle disciples from genuine disciples. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. To remain, to abide. In short, perseverance is the mark of true faith. A real disciple, a genuine believer remains. Getting back to what we mentioned at the beginning, the parable of the sower. And the reason that that's so concerning is because the mark of genuine disciples is that they remain. They continue. 
They continued to obey. They continued to follow. As Todd Friel said, a Christian is one who has repented unto salvation and continues repenting unto salvation. That's what I've mentioned here often. There are two things that Christians do. Christians repent and Christians forgive. That's what we do. Doing those things doesn't make you a Christian, but if you're not doing those things, how, why do you think you're a Christian? Christians do those things. So move ahead just briefly here to 1 John chapter 3. But in 1 John, we read in verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil commits sin from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. And yes, the construction of the verb there is continues committing. This is habitual. This is ongoing. This is lifestyle. For his seed remains in him and he cannot continue to sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loves not his brother. For this is the message you heard from him from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother... Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death into life because we love the brothers. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But whoever has these world's goods sees, not, sees his brother having need, shuts up his bowels of compassion from him. How does God's love dwell in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And we continue to read and as we mentioned John the way he writes I like Paul because it's like here's this idea and seven reasons very linear in his thinking John doesn't write that way John's weaving a tapestry for us and you see how these things circle around and everything connects to everything else and as I read John the the, the question here is what, what happens when you read You read a word like that that says, listen, if you're of God, you're not going to be sinning. If you're the devil, you're going to be sinning. What's the response of your heart? If the response of your heart is, eh, I think I'm okay. You're probably not. The response of those that are in Christ is to say, I want to be like him. And I know I'm not. When the Holy Spirit through the Word of God comes in and convicts you of sin, what is the response of your heart? Is your response to staunch that message, to tune that out, to push it away, to excuse, to justify? Or is the response of your heart to cry out to Him, I'm not right, but I need to be? Is your response, in that hymn, as, as that hymn that we sing, is your response to run to Christ? acknowledging my need, acknowledging my sin, acknowledging that I am right only through Him. See, that's the response of somebody that's trusting Christ. As it's been said, the difference between one who is a Christian and one who is not is not that the one who is Christian no longer sins. John himself, I write these things to you, brothers, who believe that you sin not. And when we do, we have an advocate with the Father. The difference between one who is a Christian and not a Christian is not that the Christian no longer sins, but it's that the Christian now sides with God against his hated sin. I agree with God about my sin. And I want to line up with him on my sin. And I want to confess my sin and turn from my sin and not be found in my sin. I acknowledge it before him. The response of these that Jesus is speaking to, he says, the truth will make you free. We're, we're not in bondage. What are you talking about? There's Carson that said, Jesus is never interested in multiplying numbers of converts if they're not genuine believers. So he insists on forcing these would-be disciples to count the cost. You say you believe me? Okay, here's what that means. You're going to continue. You're going to abide. You're going to follow. You're going to stay with me. That's what it means. Jesus illuminates true belief. True belief continues in 
the word. Our response to the word reveals the truth of our belief. Jesus says to them in verse 37, my word has no place in you. Verse 43, you cannot hear my word. Verse 47, he that is of God hears God's words. You'd hear them not because you're not of God. How do you respond to God and his truth? How do you respond to God's word? Do you hear it? Do you hear it? What is the response that's needed? Mentioned in our prayer this morning, at least just referenced, the Heidelberg Catechism asks its first question, what is my ultimate joy, my comfort in life and death? And that's to know that I belong to Him. Body and soul, in life and death, I belong to Him because He has paid, fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood. I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's my comfort. And it asks, what must you know in order to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sin and misery. Third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. What is the response to the word. How can I know that I'm right with God? Where does it start? It starts by knowing my sin. He's revealed my condition. He's revealed my true nature apart from Christ. I am in rebellion against my creator. That's a miserable state. I'm in rebellion to him and enslaved, to my, enslaved by my sin. but I can be set free by the truth of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man lifted up, who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, when he was threatened, he threatened not. When he was reviled, he didn't revile again, but he committed himself to the one that judges righteously. And he's given us an example to follow him. Jesus' light exposes our darkness, illuminates our true condition, illuminates our true nature, but illuminates true belief. We end here where we ended before. Only those who follow truly believe. Will you hear the word and will you follow? That's what Jesus calls us to, even today.